Okay, so I'll begin this evening's uh, talk, um, topics for a Dhamma talk. And I got a couple of nice uh, emails and faxes. And one I'm going to read out because I thought it was quite funny. And it's very apt because I've just come back from a, a very tiring teaching tour of Thailand and uh, Indonesia and Singapore. And uh, just, I don't know, about 10 days. And, about eight cities giving talks in many places, just like uh, being like a rolling stone, just giving a, a one gig, one night, one night stands. But uh, the question was, I'd like to hear a talk on how Ajahn Brahm copes with being a high flyer. The CEO of Rio Tinto, who I work for, does not travel as much as Ajahn Brahm does. <laughs> I'd like some tips on how he manages with the stress of airports, capital cities, not getting sick from other people on long haul flights. In short, how to be a high flyer. And somebody else in Ottawa asked me to talk a little bit about the, uh, the three jewels, or the three gems, and the, the precepts. So as usual, I'd like to combine these things together. Uh, because if you just talk about things like the triple gem or precepts, it can be a bit too theoretical. And actually, if you explain how these things are actually uh, used in daily life, for example, someone like me who sort of flies around, how can you actually use these things to make your job a more peaceful, a more tolerable, and more enjoyable? Uh, because it's true, I do fly a lot. There's many people I get to know personally now in Perth Airport. Even our librarian, Abby, she's here. Oh, she's in the front. I keep meeting your cousin at the immigration. <laughs> Let alone all the other people who stamp my passport, who say hello, and where are you going this time, Ajahn Brahm? And you just spend a lot of time up in the aircraft. I know that sometimes people think that that's not environmentally good because of all the greenhouse gases which uh, jet aircraft spew into the atmosphere. But then again, I've got many carbon credits because I'm celibate and never had a child. And thereby, the very fact that I'm celibate and babyless means that those carbon, <laughs> the carbon which I have saved by not having children and looking after the planet by doing my bit to stop overpopulation, I think gives me enough credit to fly around the world without any guilt. But also, because of a Buddhist, we don't tend to have guilt. One of, the th <laughs> one of the things which we, do, which we don't encourage. I mean, even the idea of guilt, where does it actually come from? It all comes from believing what other people say about you. Or you know, believing other people's ideas. If you really think it was wrong, you wouldn't do it to begin with. But the point is, you know, you know it's worthwhile doing. And then some other people or society or religion says it's bad, you shouldn't do this. And it gets this conflict between what you know is right and what you're told is right. And that's something we don't have in Buddhism because we don't, actually, literally, none of you here, you don't do what you're told. <laughs> because you're not told anything. But actually, you do do what you're told. Because what Buddhism is, it tells you not what to do, but how to find out. In a tour of Indonesia and these other places where I went to recently, that's actually one question which people kept on asking. What actually is the basic difference between Buddhism and other religions? And that's actually a classic definition. If you want to ask your friends, if you want to tell your friends, they say, well, what is the difference between Buddhism and another religion? One of the classic core differences is Buddhism never tells you what to believe. It tells you how to find out. So it's really up to you. And it's a great little difference there. So, telling you what to believe often gives rise to guilt. And one of the questions, I'm really going off a point here, one of the questions which came up in Indonesia was abortion. And the reason was, because that morning the newspaper said in, I forget what city I was in, sometimes I wake up in the morning and have to look around, first of all, and find out what city I'm in. Because I'm usually it's a different city every morning. Uh, I think it was Surabaya, but someone asked me about abortion, because that morning there was an article in the newspaper about the number of abortions had gone up by about 40%. And this is a classic case of how some cultures, some religions, some traditions 
had this terrible, heavy burden and layer of guilt you know, upon something which is troublesome enough as it is to deal with. And the last thing we want, you now on top of you know, an abortion, is the guilt factor afterwards. And you now, when I was asked that question, you know, what is the Buddhist view on abortion? I said, why are you asking me? I've never had one. <laughs> what would I know? And how many of you are told it's right or told it's wrong by a man? Isn't that sort of, isn't it ridiculous? The only person who has the right, as far as I'm concerned, to say it's you know, right or wrong or whatever it is, is someone who's experienced that, who knows what it's all about who's had to face a decision which is one of the toughest in a woman's life, if not the toughest. And they have to make a decision. And they try and do the very best they can in the circumstances. It's never ever taken lightly. And the consequences, as you know, either way, consequences. And you bear those consequences. And what a, a man or a religion or a leader should do is not to make it worse by layers of guilt, but to make it more easy with layers of understanding and compassion. So we don't do guilt in Buddhism, we do kindness and say, look, there's no way I could ever know what you've gone through unless I go to previous lives. But on this life, there's no way I can feel what you're feeling. So all I can do and all I should do is to give you that compassion and kindness. Whichever way you decide, I will always be your friend and always be there for you. And to support you, never to condemn you. Because you can see just how guilt makes everything so much more painful. So because we don't do guilt in Buddhism, sort of, you know, <laughs> we don't feel guilty for these things. So that's one of the reasons why I can fly around quite happily. It's not only that, it's the attitude which you have you know, when you have to do these things. One rule which I always try and keep whenever I go travelling is never ever to look at my itinerary beyond the present day. Because if I looked at these things, and once I did that, I looked at all these things which I had to do, you know, from getting up early in the morning, going to give this talk, visiting that person, going on TV, going on radio, and just about midnight, you see, when you finish. And if I looked upon it, I think that's impossible. You just can't do that. You just get tired out. You'll never be able to achieve you know, that schedule. But when I didn't look at it, you just only got 24 hours a day. Every minute's just a minute. So you've got to be somewhere. You've got to be doing something. So I found out when I didn't look at the schedule, I stopped worrying about the future. When you don't worry about the future, you don't put your mind away from the present moment, that's when you get stressed out and get tired. Whereas actually doing all of these things is very easy. But thinking about it was the hard part. That's one of the basic teachings of Buddhism. If you don't know that teaching, that's in my book, Opening the Door of Your Heart. And I'll tell that story in brief because it's a wonderful story. My teacher Ajahn Chah was building his hall. After building the hall, there was a lot of earth left over. And in those days, instead of using like a, a backhoe or sort of an earth mover, they didn't need to have all that equipment in Thailand because they had the junior monks like me. <laughs> so why waste money on a bulldozer? We didn't get 50 or 60 months pushing wheelbarrows. So after our one meal of the day, just one meal of the day, and it was just a very simple meal, some sticky rice and maybe a fish, or as I said sometimes, a frog and a banana, nothing really much to go on. And you'd be half of that. Ajahn Chah said, we've got to move this earth, and a huge amount of earth. And that was three days of hard work from about nine we used to finish about 9 o'clock, 9.15, maybe 9.30, until about 10 o'clock, because we used um, lamps to push the earth at night time. No lunch, no dinner break, no smoko, as in Australia. 
it was just full on. And then the next morning the same, and the next day, for three days. There's one thing which made me, got me through this. I had this immense faith and, and a sense of adventure and joy. You're really doing something worthwhile in your life. You know, building a monastery. Now I understood the law of karma enough that if you do something good, you're always going to get something wonderful back. So when we finished moving the earth after three days, very, very tired, I thought, wonderful, tomorrow I can wash some clothes, get very sweaty and dirty, have a good shower, and uh, have some meditation the following day. But that night, Ajahn Chah left for another monastery. And the following morning, after breakfast, the deputy abbot called us all together and he said, I've been thinking about that pile of earth. It's in the wrong place. Why don't we move it over here? <sighs> but he had a point. I could see what he meant. And again, I still had lots of faith. So for another three days, just on one meal a day, pushing wheelbarrows, shoveling dirt in the mosquito-ridden hot jungles of northeast Thailand. Ah, oh, that was tough. But we finished six days of hard work. I think, ah, oh, at last, I, I really needed to wash. I was stinking, you know, with all this uh, pushing the barrows and all your clothes get soaked. You've got no time to wash them. I thought, I'll have a nice rest tomorrow morning. Have a nice uh, uh, meditate. Have a relax, because you know, you're very tired, your muscles were sore. And that night, Ajahn Chah came back. And the following morning, he got all our monks together and said, I told you to put the earth over here, you put it over there. Move it. <laughs> I often say that was the time when I lost my faith. Because <laughs> these senior monks, they don't shovel earth or push wheelbarrows. They just sit in their huts talking to people and giving sermons like I'm doing now. And it's all right for them to sort of have all these great ideas and they don't have to do the work. It's just not on, it's just not right. And I got very angry. But you had no choice, you had to push those down wheelbarrows. But when I did, that's when he started to swear. Because that's, that's the English, Australian way of doing things, isn't it? When, when things go wrong, you swear. But of course, you swear in time, you swear in English, so the time marks can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> Only it doesn't quite work that way, because they can see by your body language you're upset. And that was when, this is the good karma from doing all this work for six days. I got a big pay, payback. Because a monk came up to me, he saw I was very upset and angry, and he said, pushing the wheelbarrow is easy, thinking about it is the hard part. And wow, that was worth pushing wheelbarrows for 20 days. Because that, that really just, it's just a change of attitude, that just stopped so many problems, not just pushing wheelbarrows in every other part of my life. Because it's so true. I, understood what he said, enough to stop thinking about it, stop worrying about it, stop complaining, just push. And when I wasn't thinking about it, that wheelbarrow felt lighter. And he had a lot of fun for three days with the monks, you know, pushing wheelbarrows, telling jokes and having a good time. Yeah, it was tiring, but mentally, he had a lot of fun. And I learned from that experience. And after three days, we were finished. Unfortunately, both the deputy and the abbot now agree that was the right place for the earth. <laughs> I was quite relieved of that. But I learned a great lesson from that. Whatever you have to do in life, thinking about it is a hard part. Doing it is very easy. And every now and again, you test yourself out. Just last, what was it, um, June, July, you flew from Perth to Toronto to give some talks. And that was a very long flight. And that was like about 36 hours. And I, thir I think one of those 40 hours, the other 36 hours coming back, because lots of connections. And when I was in Los Angeles airport, there was a bomb scare. And that was actually wonderful having a bomb scare, because it's very boring going on these aircraft. We have a bomb scare, and wow, wonderful, it wakes you up. It's better than a cup of coffee. And it, was in, it got a lovely story for me, which I mentioned here at the time. Because as I was going from one terminal, because the Canadian aircraft came in one terminal, I had just to walk only a couple of hundred meters to, I think, the Singapore Airlines terminal. 
Imagine was walking a police car, you know, an LAPD police car, the you know, item in the movies, came screaming down with its sirens flashing and zoo zoo zoo. It really exciting. And it screeched to a halt right in front of me. Like put on the brakes, slammed it, and went kind of halfway up the pavement. And I thought, my God, they're gonna arrest me. <laughs> what have I done? But they weren't interested in me. Instead, these two cops came out, and they didn't have guns, had like semi-automatic machine guns. I thought, wow, this is really interesting. But the doors flew open, they didn't bother to turn off the engine, or actually to close the doors, and they started running up the stairs. It was really exciting, until they got to the first landing, and then they, both of them stopped panting and heaving. <laughs> They'd run out of breath over the first flight of stairs because the real cops, not the ones in the movies, are so overweight and unfit <laughs> that no way can they ever run after sort of a, a real criminal who goes to the gym. <laughs> and it was so funny, all my fear was just, I, I creased up laughing at these cops because they were so unfit. You know, too many donuts, that's the trouble with LAPD. <laughs> And it was amusing, it's a wonderful little story. So, but when you actually started thinking about all the time you had to spend, it was impossible to do that. But you only had one minute every minute, so you're always in the present moment, just relaxing and just enjoying yourself. And uh, that way, you never felt so tired. When you're traveling, whatever else you're doing, it's the mental energy which gets sapped. I know why it gets sapped, because thinking about it, if I thought, 36 hours flight on a plane, that's terrible. Well, you don't think about it, you just do it. 36 hours goes past. And one thing I did find out many, many years ago, I think I was flying from Adelaide to Perth. And you know, instead of just looking at the magazines or whatever, I just sat down and just meditated for an hour and a half. And if you meditate when you're traveling, you've got nothing much else to do. So you meditate there, and I found out you get much less jet lag. You don't feel so tired. It's a great opportunity to do some meditation. I know some people keep telling me, oh, life is so busy, we don't have time to meditate. You have 36 hours. What a wonderful opportunity to get in some nice meditation. I remember sometimes I've gone into meditation while I've been on the aircraft. The trouble is the flight attendants come up to you afterwards and say, Oh, you had a very lovely sleep. You were so, so I wasn't asleep, I was meditating. Because <laughs> I think you're sleeping. They said, you can always sort of put the, the chair back if you want to. I said, I don't need a chair back, I'm meditating. So sometimes they don't understand. But one thing I did think about once in aircraft, if you did meditate, sitting on the floor, you could actually get two layers of people instead of one. Thereby you could actually get sort of more people in an aircraft and you get much better profits. So one day I thought of starting you know, Buddha Air, where we don't have any seats, everybody sits on the ground with little cushions and zappers underneath. You will save a lot of money and get more people in. And you don't need in-flight entertainment because you just meditate while you're sort of going there. So even a small plane, you get twice as many people in. You don't need, the only reason why you have to have these aisles is because the people actually have to go back and forth serving you things. And that's really a waste of time. So it would make a lot of, uh, talk about cut, uh, what is it, not cut price airlines. What do they call, what do they not call cut price airlines? What do they call? Budget airlines, budget airlines. Because you, know, you keep the BUD of budget and add DIHT on the end, so Buddhist airlines. And that would mean you get more people in. And because you're meditating, you know, you're very calm, you don't need food or water. So that way, you know, on these lovely flights, you just get into jhana when you sort of uh, leave and come out when you get back again, nice and fresh. And that's really what I call in flight entertainment. So who knows, one day that might happen. But anyway, one thing I did find, when you're in the present moment, and you're very peaceful, you don't think too much, there's no trouble, there's no problem at all. And even the person who asked that question about being sick, it's very rare I get sick on these airlines. Maybe sick sort of beforehand, I mean, when I was in Sri Lanka got a cough, but that was because I was with other monks in a car and they were all coughing, 
Although in the last trip, which I did, I had a very sick arm for a couple of days. Because when I was in Jakarta, there was such a big crowd, and there was a new book of mine out, don't worry, it was in Indonesian. <laughs> and it was over that evening, I signed over 1,000 books. <coughs> I should have done that, but I was never thinking about 1,000. I don't think about it, I just do it. Just sign a book and sign a book and sign a book. And the next morning I couldn't raise my arm. It was so stiff. I was very fortunate though. There was, uh, I saw a Thai monk there and he gave me this wonderful massage. And that night I went to sleep and the following morning the arm was completely back to normal again. I think it may not have been the massage, it may be because I got a sore arm from doing something which was good and worthwhile. Because that's the other thing which I found. If you're going on a sort of an aircraft and doing a lot of heavy work, but it's not really for a good cause, it's something sort of selfish or personal, just for your own benefit, you don't get energy, you don't get peace. Because one thing, another thing I found, whenever you're doing something for somebody else, or for, you know, for the monastery or for the Buddhist society, you find you get much more energy. I found this out again, going to stories in my early life as a monk, when we, we did it tough as a monk, when you're training as a monk, it's not an easy thing. You have to be physically strong, mentally peaceful in order to survive. Because we only had three robes. You know, the upper robe we have and one which we, an outer robe and a lower robe. And to become a monk, Ajahn Shah said, you had to make your own robes out of white cloth, which is so, and you die. And the dying process for dyeing the robes was using jackfruit wood. In Sri Lanka they used the same when I went to um, Naoyana and, uh, and one of the other forest monasteries. Just the same as we did. There's so much commonality through the different countries with the forest tradition. So we had to take the wood, chop it up into little chips, haul water from the well, start a fire. There was no electricity, it was all just basic stuff and boil this wood until you got the sap out, concentrate that sap until you can dye your robes. And these three monks, three, or those three monks were ordaining. And they all had to do all this within about three or four days. And they'd been working for about 48 hours without any rest. No sleep. They had to keep on doing this because it took that amount of time. I think really Amnesty International should investigate some of these forest monasteries. <laughs> but, one evening after the chanting and meditation, evening meditation, about 9.30, and I was tired, but I had a lot of compassion for these young monks. They hadn't slept for two nights. So I went up to the dying ship and they said, come on guys, you go and take a break, go and take some sleep. You know, I was skilled enough, I'll look after the fire and the dye pot for you all night. And of course, <laughs> they never sort of argued. <laughs> Before I could even finish uh, speaking, they were off. Because <laughs> they were just so tired. We hadn't slept for such a long time, it was very painful. So they went and had a good rest and I worked all night. And at three o'clock in the morning when we would get up there, and when the bell went, and they sort of came out saying, thank you, we had some rest, it was so wonderful, thank you so much. And I went to do the chanting and morning meditation. And that morning I was not tired at all. I had so much energy. It was so weird not having slept all night and having worked really hard, and now you're meditating and you're perfectly bright and going on arms round afterwards, which we would do, walking through the village. I was like, running, jumping up and down. I had so much energy inside my body. It was so strange, I asked the senior monk at the time, what's happening? It was like I was on speed or something. And he said, you've got energy because you've just sacrificed all night to help somebody else. That's the energy you get when you give, when you help, when you do something selfless. And that's what I've employed in my life. So if you're going on a long journey to help somebody else, you get huge amounts of energy coming up. It doesn't matter how tired you are. You may get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, which I was doing, and not go to bed till about 11.30 or 12 some nights. 
and just spending a lot of time with other people. It's really tough being a monk because you go and give these big talks to two, three thousand people and they sign books and take photographs and answer questions and maybe they let you go about eleven o'clock and then somebody drives you back to where you're staying. But when they drive you back, that's their opportunity to ask you questions. <laughs> they got you stuck in the car. <laughs> That doesn't matter, they can ask whatever. But I know that when you do give for other people, you get energy back. So if I'm traveling or working hard for a bigger cause, you have huge amounts of energy. But if I was doing it for myself, what I want, what I need, then you get tired. So if you're going to be a high flyer, then make sure it's for a service which is much bigger than you. For a cause, for a reason which is really worthwhile in the world. And if you can identify such a cause, such a reason for working hard, you'd be surprised how much energy you can call on. Karma, an instant result when you do something selfless and kind. So that's one of the reasons why all these journeys, I have a great time going on there. But it's really impossible when I look at how much work is done. And even my hosts say, come on Ajahn Brahm, you're pushing 60, about time you slow down. No, you get energy, you get joy, you get a wonderful sense of inspiration doing these things. So that's how you're a high flyer, and because you've got good energy, because you've got positive mind, that's also why you don't get sick. You know, it was... <laughs> First year as a monk in Thailand, all the monks were getting sick with diarrhea, especially, and all these other diseases, because this was really basic village food. And to give you an example of what we used to eat every day, I was cleaning up around our monastery kitchen, and there was an earthen jar with rotten fish inside crawling with maggots because usually they, they keep the fish in the winter t in the uh, rainy season and they put it in a jar and they just put some plastic over the top of the jar with a rubber band and keep it in there as a source of protein in the dry weather when there's nothing to eat so that's you know, how they um, keep the fish However, this particular jar, the plastic had torn and the flies had got inside and so it was crawling with maggots. So I picked it up and went to throw it away. At which point, the head man of the village, who happened to be visiting that monastery at the time, who was the most educated and respected man in the whole village, said, what are you doing? I said, look, it's gone off, it's got maggots in it. And he snatched the, the jar from me and said, that's extra protein. <laughs> and the next day, we had the same fish in our curry. <laughs> and it was gross, what we had to do there. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, no matter how gross it was, so, you know, you really had energy and you never really thought about it. But nevertheless, many people got sick. I remember once, all these people getting sick, having diarrhea, and I, I made a resolution. For one year, I'm not going to get sick. And people thought I was stupid. They said, you can't just decide not to get sick. But I thought it was a wonderful experiment to do. And I was a scientist. It was just this power of resolution, of positive thinking. And it, was, it worked. For one year, I never got sick. And all these other monks were coming in the morning, oh, I was on the toilet all night, oh, I had diarrhea, oh, yeah, me, I never made it to the toilet, says somebody else. <laughs> and they were all so complaining, they looked at me and said, I had a good night's sleep, I'm fine. <laughs> you can ask some of the monks who were with me at the time, and that's what happened. And it was not that I was physically robust, it was just a mental attitude. Now it is true, I'm sure doctors here and psychologists would actually say that mental attitude is very, very important. And so if you are going to be a high flyer, if you are going to do things, if you are going to be around other people who are sick, be careful of your mental attitude. 
because your mental attitude can either in, it, enhance your immune system or completely weaken it. You don't complain. You don't be afraid. Because that's one of the things, I was never really a fearful person. So I wasn't afraid of these things. Because you weren't afraid, you tended never to get those sicknesses. Even malaria. There's in many malarial areas. And sometimes you think, who knows, maybe this mosquito might be the one with the malaria. Because you can't tell, you know, they all look the same. They don't have a big M on their backs saying they're malarial. Well, you're just okay, come on, you're going to bite me anyway, just get over and done with it. And so you were kind to the mosquitoes, you never worried about them, you never got sort of sick. So this was actually really weird, where I found from my own personal experience, your mental attitude is really important. So if you come to places like this, and you meditate and get some positive um, counselling, if you like, and how to keep a positive attitude. Now, don't just keep thinking, worrying about what you have to do. Just do it only one minute at a time. Don't send your mind off into the future. How much work is in front of you? Just what the work is you're doing right this moment. So you need to think about and make sure that this brick which you're laying now is good. This little um, sentence which you're composing in the letter right now, this sentence is okay. That's actually how we built up this Buddhist society in our monasteries. It literally has been one brick at a time. You just lay a brick and see where the next one has to go. Literally that's what happens. So we plan too much in life. We tend to sort of get worried and afraid. We also just lose our perspective. And I've often mentioned here, where is your future made? Now. When is the only time you can affect your future? Now. Whenever you just waste time worrying about the future, you're neglecting the very place your future is being made. So right now, you're making your peace, your health and prosperity. This is where it's happening. If you don't pay attention to the place where things are happening, no wonder things don't go as well as they might. That's why when you're on a flight, you're just in the moment. Where you are, you're not sort of sending your mind to the destination or thinking, how many hours to go? When are we going to get there? Or calling the flight attendant, can you please ask the pilot to take a shortcut? <laughs> I've got to get, get to my destination quicker. Can you put his foot down on the accelerator and speed up a bit? You can't do that. That's one of the nice things about being in an aircraft. You're completely out of control. And that's one of the nice things I like. As soon as you sit back in that seat, you can do absolutely nothing. You can't get there faster or slower. That's why I like it. It's like meditating. In meditation, you let go of all control. Nothing to do. Because if you try and make meditation happen, you just make problems for yourself. And it doesn't happen. But when you really let go, relax, then you can enjoy the flight. And meditation is like travelling on aircraft. All you need to do is get on your seat, your meditation cushion, your stool or your chair. Once you strap yourself in, then you take off into the nice meditations. You don't have to do anything. And every so often, the flight attendant comes up to you. That's what it does to me. Do you want a cup of tea, sir? Do you want sort of a breakfast, sir? Would you like a cup of coffee or a hot towel? And in meditation, it's just like someone comes up to you and says, you know, do you want jhana, sir? Mm, yeah, okay, I'll have some jhana today. <laughs> Would you like um, insight? Yeah, I'll have some insight. What's on, what's on the menu? Oh, we have stream winning. <laughs> on the menu once we're turning full enlightenment. Do you want full enlightenment today? <laughs> oh yeah, thank you very much, I'll do fine. And it's all brought to you and served to you. That's actually what happens in meditation. You never go and make peace happen. You never go running down the aisles, grabbing the tent. Give me some peace! Give me some forgiveness! Give me some compassion! You can't do that. It all comes to you when you sit down, relax and let go, which is what you do in an aircraft. 
And that's why I often like the similar between meditation and aircrafts. So that's how you become a high flyer, especially in meditation. But in meditation you don't have in-flight service. I call it insight service. You sit down. <laughs> that's not a bad joke. Why are people groaning? <laughs> and, and you're served these amazing insights. And you don't go searching for them. That's one of the big mistakes of people trying to be wise. Don't go chasing wisdom. Be still, be alert, and wisdom always comes to you. It's a classic spiritual truth. Don't go searching for wisdom or trying to think it out. When you're still, you just see things, they just come. That's always the case. Flashes of insight, but only when you're still enough to listen to them. So, this is actually how you become a successful high flyer, a peaceful, happy guy. And of course, also in aircraft, it's not just getting sick, you know, because of all the other stuff which is recycled through the, um, the air conditioning. You don't, I don't get sick on aircraft. It's not only that, it's also, you know, you've got the good attitude, but, uh, and also being, being in the present moment and being nice and peaceful. But also, again, you just uh, stay in this moment. I think the most important thing is learning how to be in the present moment when you're flying in the aircraft and be very uh, peaceful, uh, not worrying about things, not thinking too much, and just relaxing, not getting tense. And also, not having too many expectations, because just like in real life, the unexpected often happens. For example, one of our monks, some of you may know him, Ajahnana Dharma, he was flying from Adelaide to Perth. And when he came, when we met him at Perth airport, he was smelling like a distillery. He smelled an alcohol, whiskey. And when we questioned him about this, because you know they serve free alcohol on aircraft, what have you been doing? And he said that as soon as he, they took off from Adelaide, the person in the next seat was obviously very, very nervous and started talking to him about how he was so afraid of flying, how he was very, very scared. And the only thing which would calm him down was a whiskey. So as soon as he could, he ordered a whiskey from the flight attendant who gave it to him. And he was drinking the whiskey and talking to the monk, having another whiskey, talking to the monk, having another whiskey, talking to the monk until just before they landed in Perth, he had whiskey in his hand and there was turbulence. <laughs> and the whiskey went all over Ajahnana Dhamma and soaked his robes. And that's why he smelled like a, like a pub when he came out of the aircraft. At least that was his, <laughs> that was his excuse. <laughs> but we believe him, he could walk in a straight line. <laughs> you do get these problems being a bike on the aircraft. But sometimes also aircraft are delayed or they get delayed. And one of the things which I've noticed is just crazy. Why is it whenever there's a delay or a cancellation that people get angry? I still remember, and I told this story actually in Indonesia because the last time I was going to Indonesia on the Garuda flight it was delayed for 24 hours. And I remember, I went up to the counter, they said, oh, and it's been cancelled, delayed for 24 hours. Oh, okay, fine. And I sort of called up somebody, I asked, can I use a phone, because I haven't got a mobile. I said, yeah, sure. Called up someone to, to rescue me from the airport. There was no problem, but the fellow after me, he went up to the counter, he was banging his fist on the table, you can't do this to me, I've got an important appointment, it's one day off my holiday. I forget what he was saying, but he was very angry. And because he was angry, the plane never came any earlier. All his shouting did was give him a sore throat and a sore hand. And to me that's stupid. Of course, if he could shout and get the aircraft to come earlier, fine. But it didn't. And I figured out at the time, this was a time when you know, there was bird flu all over Indonesia. And Garuda was a bird. I thought, oh, it must have got bird flu. Garuda realized. <laughs> So we just left it like that because what it taught me is you can't control things. That life happens and it's unexpected. And it's only when people have these 
plans plans which are fixed in concrete you have to get there at a certain time you have to you know, meet that particular aircraft to catch your flight. There's always another flight going next. It's never the end of the world. And these aircraft companies, they put you up in a nice hotel. Actually, that's the only time. I was, Qantas was delayed once when I was going somewhere, about again, another 24 hours. And I got to stay in the Perth Sheraton as a monk. It was a great opportunity. Never been there before. How could I ever stay in the Sheraton Hotel up in, in Perth? I don't know, it was at Sheraton, it was the higher. It was the higher, you know, in the, sort of next to the police station in East Perth. And because by the time they decided the plane wasn't going to come, it was at three o'clock in the morning. And I thought of, they would pay a taxi for me to come to Nolamara. But I don't think I would be able to wake up the caretaker. No respect to the caretaker. It wasn't the present caretaker. It was one of the previous ones. They wouldn't wake up at three o'clock in the morning if they saw a monk banging on the door. So I decided a free hotel at Sheraton, or the Hyatt. I said, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> so I've got to stay at the Hyatt. <laughs> or for free. That was good fun. So when these things, I don't get angry. I think it's a great opportunity. It's a nice, nice adventure. And that's what life is like an adventure. So what I learned from traveling is you never know what's going to happen next. Completely unexpected. And because it's unexpected, and you know it's going to be unexpected, you never get angry. A lot of anger comes when we get frustrated. And what is frustration anyway? Our expectations and plans don't work out. And it's amazing just how expectations turn into demands which lead to frustration and eventually to anger. When you don't have much planned, you don't expect much out of Qantas or out of, or out of Garuda. I'm just happy it lands safely, because some of them don't. I was in one of the aircraft flying to Indonesia and the guy sitting next to me was, was reading a newspaper. Hey, look at this. What is it? Turkish airline crashes and splits in three. Thank you very much because <laughs> We haven't landed yet. <laughs> well, you don't get worried about this. It's not expected. So if you die anyway, and I keep on, if you haven't heard this one before, if you die in a plane crash, it's actually, it's a wonderful way to go. Especially the best way of dying is in an aircraft explosion by a terrorist at 30,000 feet. It is, it's the best way of going for three reasons. The three benefits of dying at 30,000 feet in a terrorist explosion. Number one, instant cremation. <laughs> Gratis. So those of you who've had a mother or father die know how difficult it is arranging these things with the funeral directors. So much work and carriages and flowers and things you have to worry about, putting notices in the newspaper and finding a time at Karakata or uh, uh, Pinaru or Fremantle for the cremation. It's just such a hassle. Aircraft explosion is done all for you, instant, very efficient. Number two, <laughs> the benefits of the dying at 30,000 feet in terrorist explosion is how much do cremations or funerals cost? A huge amount of money, but if you die at 30,000 feet, not only is it instant, but your family makes money out of your death. <laughs> because insurance, they give you a payout, and it's quite substantial, I think, at least 10,000 bucks. I remember seeing that in the sort of the, the uh, Warsaw Convention or something. They've got to pay at least 10,000 if you die. So, you know, it's, it's good money, especially in these days of uh, economic crisis. <laughs> <laughs> but the best, the very, very best benefit of dying at 30,000 feet in an aircraft explosion is you're so close to heaven, it's easy to go the other way. <laughs> There are three benefits of dying at 30,000 feet. So you can see we have a positive attitude about this. You don't get worried about things. Unexpected happens. You always make something good out of it. Every time that something's gone wrong in my plans, or usually other people's plans, you don't make it to the talk on time, or something goes late, the aircraft doesn't turn up, or if something happens, I always find it really interesting and one of the fun parts of life when you experience things you never expected. And you go to places you never dreamed of going. Getting hijacked. Wow. 
<laughs> Where am I going to go for that? <laughs> so you can see like going in aircraft, you're open to the unexpected. This you should be. Just like life. So if you know how to have very little plans, you don't worry about being late or whatever. This is a story I think I've told here before. This, I think this guy told me this in Thailand. It's as an experience which changed his whole life. He was in Bombay. This was when it was Bombay, not Mumbai. And he got in a taxi to go to the airport. Now, I don't, don't know where he was flying. And the taxi driver got lost. Now, you expect taxi drivers actually to know the way. And that's what you get in the taxi for. But this guy got completely lost. And as the minutes were going past, where's the, you know, the airport? It's this way. No, 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 sir, that way. And the, the minutes were ticking by, and he was really scared he was going to miss his plane. He had nothing, no other way to get there. He was in the taxi. And he was just hoping and praying his aircraft would be delayed, which is you know, quite a reasonable chance. But when he got to Bombay Airport, he saw his plane taking off. Stupid drive! He got really angry. The next minute, he saw the plane come down again, crash, with no survivors. Imagine that, this true story, he came and told me this. That completely changed his life. There he was angry at the driver for being late, so he missed his flight. And a minute later, he was thanking the driver for saving his life. If that taxi had been on time, he would have been dead. And things like that, the unexpected, what are you taught him? The unexpected, you don't know what's going to happen next. So be open to the unexpected. Don't get angry when your plans go wrong. Because sometimes it's for far better outcomes than if your plans went right. So this is as a Buddhist, as a spiritual person, you're open to the unexpected. You do have a few plans, but you don't keep them so firm and strict. You can get angry and upset about them if they don't go right. And that way you can be a high flyer and go all over the world. You're late for this, you're early for something else. But there's always opportunities, unexpected things happen. Wonderful. So you can see that that type of attitude in high flying makes it easy to travel. You don't get tired, you don't get frustrated in big cities or small cities. You know, who cares? They're all just good fun. Traffic jams. You know, this is in Indonesia there's so much traffic, especially in Jakarta, it's always getting jammed up there. It's wonderful because they're going so fast I can't appreciate the view. It's my first time I've been there. And especially I tell them, if they get lost, that's even better. Because when you get lost, you know, you get to see some parts of the city which they never expected to take you to. So getting lost, I think, is a wonderful way of touring around the sorts of streets which no one usually goes down. So, whatever the things happen, I always see the benefit, the positive in it, which is true. So these sorts of attitudes are what we mean by taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Rather than plans and expectations. To me, the Buddha stands for peace. For me, Dharma stands for wisdom. For me, Sangha stands for compassion. Peace, wisdom and compassion. That's why I go for refuge, for peace. Not for activity, anxiety, and getting anger. That's not peaceful. Because I know that getting angry in an aircraft, traveling, expectations not fulfilled, whatever, doesn't change anything. It just makes you mad, literally, and gets rid of your good health, getting angry at people. So you don't get angry. You respect peace. You remember the Buddha. He's a peaceful person. And then wisdom. So great opportunities for learning about life. So already, you know, I've just spent 50 minutes giving a talk about flying an aircraft and how it taught me so much. Or how moving earth in a monastery, labouring, how that taught me. You know, just helping other people, how that really changed my life about how to give and get more energy. And how to sort of spend time in the moment and not sort of start complaining and, and worrying. Doing it is easy, thinking about it is a hard point. And that wisdom just changes your whole life. You, know, you do become a more peaceful, happy person, because that's the job of wisdom. 
Wisdom is what solves problems. And if you think you're wise and you're still getting angry, upset, tense, that's not wisdom, that's just thoughts and opinions and ideas. You know it's wisdom because it makes you peaceful. Because it does calm things down, it solves problems. That's why wisdom exists, that's its job. And lastly, just compassion. Because you know, the Sangha, the community of monks and nuns, they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be the, the ethos, being wise, compassionate, virtuous people. So I always remember like, you know, people like my teacher Ajahn Chah, just so compassionate and kind, he never criticizes you. Even though I did some stupid, stupid, stupid things, when I did stupid things, he just laugh. He thought it was so funny when Western monks were stupid. We gave him so much pleasure. <laughs> and, that's, and that's why I was just compassion and kindness there. And so we're sort of getting angry and shouting at us. So compassion is something which is really important. So I'm compassionate to Qantas and Singapore Airlines and Garuda and all these pilots and other people. I'm compassionate and kind to you know, all these kids on the aircraft who keep screaming. Aah! And you're just sitting right behind them. Yeah, that's what kids are like. Poor things having to go on the aircraft, they can't play around. Even more compassionate to those poor mothers who have to deal with their screaming kids on an aircraft, no place to go. And compassion solves a problem. So I take refuge when I'm going on an aircraft in, in peace, wisdom and compassion. And that's just one example of what we mean by taking refuge. And if you've got cancer, or do you take refuge when you've got cancer? Do you take refuge in praying, please, I don't want to die, please, I don't want to die? So you go to the, the Buddhist uh, temple on Friday, you go to the uh, Friday evening, you go to the um, Catholic church on Saturday, the Protestant church on Sunday, <laughs> go to the synagogue on Monday just to make sure that somebody got the right answer and works, they get rid of your cancer. That's not what you take refuge in, praying to somebody to help you. You don't even take refuge too much, sort of even in medicine. Isn't it wonderful to take refuge in peace, wisdom and compassion when you've got cancer? Make yourself peaceful. Every doctor knows that the more peaceful you are, the more chance that cancer is of going into recession. If it doesn't go into recession, you die, you die wonderfully well, peacefully. <coughs> Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? Wisdom. Understand what, what is cancer here for? Why? It's obviously to teach us something. To teach us how to deal with our bodies, how to be more kind, relaxed, look after them better. Teach us, you know, that death happens. And it's not a matter of how long you live, but the quality of your life. All these people say, I'm too young to die. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. What I always look for when I do funeral services is the quality of that person's life. Maybe only 15 years they've lived, but what were those 15 years like? What the quality? And sometimes you see like a 15 year old who's lived such a wonderful life. They've been a really inspiring person. And they don't get, happy, don't get sad at their death. And sometimes I see like an 80 year old who died. And never done anything for anybody. Just looked after themselves, never really done any social service, never really sort of made an impression on their family. And that's sad. It doesn't matter how old you are when you die, it's how well you've lived. It makes me sad or happy when I see someone who's died. So this is what wisdom means. And compassion. Be kind to yourself, even if you're not wise, if you're stupid. Just be kind to your stupidity. We all do stupid things from time to time. And I do many, many stupid things. Always sometimes, my big problem is sometimes you know, people come up to me and say, do you remember me? And I sort of say, I remember you, but I get it wrong. <laughs> now you're the, person, you're the person I met in prison, wasn't it? I've never been in prison! <laughs> What are you trying to insinuate of a bad person? <laughs> so sometimes I get into big trouble by getting people wrong. 
Well, you know, that you can kind, compassionate to yourself when you do stupid things. And also you're compassionate to other people when they're stupid as well. And you're compassionate to your body and to the mind and to the whole world. That kindness, I love taking refuge in kindness, which accepts people and the world as they are. Because you, know, you go to all these different places in the world, whether it's to Indonesia or to Sri Lanka, to Thailand, to Singapore, and girls and boys, gays, prisoners, they're just people. Yeah, they do stupid things, just like I do stupid things. But they're people, and you can love them for just being humans. Animals, insects, there's mosquitoes being mosquitoes. What do you expect mosquitoes to do? They're hungry, so here you go. Have something to eat, mate. <laughs> when you're compassionate like that, you have a much more wonderful life. So when you take refuge in peace, wisdom and compassion, there's three refuges. And it gives it a meaning. Whatever you have to do in life, always take that refuge. That's what a refuge means. It means a place of safety and security. Some place you can go when you're in trouble. A refuge. You've got women's refuges, you probably have men's refuges, maybe have a monk refuge one day. I don't know. But actually we don't need a monk refuge because we've got meditation as my refuge. Peace, wisdom and compassion. Your refuge in life. That's for me the triple gem. That's why it's a gem. It's so valuable. You can't put a put a price in dollars on peace. And wisdom, I mean real wisdom which solves problem. Wow. That's just so valuable. When you know how to live in life and people come up and they're sort of very sick or you get sick and you're in problems or whatever, you can be wise and compassionate. Isn't it when you see a compassionate person or a compassionate act? Everybody respects that. Everybody thinks, wow, what a beautiful thing to see. A real, true act of kindness. That's why we worship those things, while they are refuges. And if we do that, we keep our precepts. I've only got two minutes left. So I know that sometimes people think, oh, these Buddhists, they have five precepts, not to kill, to steal. Commit adultery, lie, or take alcohol and drugs. And they think, oh, five precepts is too much. So, out of compassion, out of wisdom, wanting a peaceful life for people who can't keep five precepts, these days I teach people two precepts. Nice and easy, just keep two precepts. And those two precepts, never do anything by body, speech or mind, which harms another being, human or otherwise. Don't do anything which harms others. That's precept number one. And precept number two, never do anything by body, speech or mind, which harms yourself. Precept number two, don't give harm to yourself or to others in the world. And just keep those two precepts. So don't shout at your husband. Don't feel guilty at yourself or get angry at yourself. Look after your body. Give it a rest and decent food. But also, be kind to your mind. Give it a break. Don't harm your body. Don't harm your mind. And don't harm others either. The two Buddhist precepts and I never invented that. That was the Buddha's advice to his own son, Rahula. The two precepts. So taking refuge in peace, wisdom, compassion, having two precepts and never harming yourself and others. Then you understand how you can be a high flyer. Even if you never travel on an aircraft in your life, still, Whatever you have to do in this world, whatever you're called on to do, you can do it with fun, with joy, and also with peace in your heart. That's combining the two talks, how to be a high flyer, and the meaning of the Triple Gem, and the two great precepts. Thank you for listening. Okay, here we go, another day, another talk. Any questions?
Any questions, comments, or complaints? Yes. Yeah, go on, yeah. With all my compassion and love and understanding, I know people that when they leave after an hour or so, I feel absolutely drained mentally and physically. Apparently, there are exceptions to the rule. Oh, yeah. But for those people who get drained, or upset, or angry, ah, just make peace, be kind, be gentle. That's what sometimes happens. So sometimes people go crazy with aircraft. And just this, it would happen just on one of the flights. You know what happens? People rush to get on the aircraft first. It doesn't matter if they get on first, we all arrive at the same time. <laughs> and when the plane lands, they rush to get off first. And this happened, I forget which city. People, as soon as we landed, they rushed to the front of the aircraft to get off. And then, ha ha ha, we disembarked at the rear, rear exit. <laughs> so they were all crashed in the front, and I just waited for everybody else could get out of the rear exit and beat everybody. <laughs> I love it when those sort of things happen. Just sort of fits my sense of view. All these people rushing up to the front. You just wait there and you get out first. <laughs> so that's that's life. You know, people just rushing off and doing things. And after a while, stop rushing around. Just like life, it doesn't matter whether you sit in first class or you sit in the rear of the cabin. Sometimes, you know, you all get to the destination at the same time. So just let go and enjoy the ride. Instead of just struggling so to, to be the best, to get there first, and to be the top of the top of the whatever it is you're trying to be. Ah, oh, just stop all that business and take it easy. Much more fun. So thank you for your comment. Any other comments, questions or complaints? Okay, any complaints, refer it to the president. Any compliments, you can come to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you the other way around, Mrs. President. Okay, well, thank you for listening.